All right, uh, good afternoon. I'd Sorry. like to convene the special select board meeting on February 8th. Has the meeting been officially warned? Yes, it has. Yes, it has. And uh, a couple of things here to the uh, people who are in attendance. This is a dual meeting, uh, and we will be discussing uh, liquor and tobacco licenses for the first hour. We will, we're going to finish up with this portion of the meeting at 5 o'clock. And then we will uh, become utility water and sewer commissioners and discuss the uh, budget for the second half of the meeting. I would also ask that if you haven't signed in, uh, please sign in uh, before you leave uh, so we can have that as a record. Uh, I will start with public participation. If there's anyone here that wants to talk about something that's not on our two agenda items today, uh, please come up to the microphone, state your name and the town that you're from, and uh, we'll give you about two minutes. Uh, but as I look out, uh, it looks like everybody's here for either A or B on the agenda. So I will accept a motion to go into uh, uh, liquor, liquor commissioners. So moved. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 4 0. Oh, and we are liquor commissioners. Just to start off um, briefly with what you have in your packets you have the, um, you, you had the information that you received, that we received from the Bradbury Area Prevention Coalition. Um, and I think you have, you've had that for from several weeks now. There's extra copies if anyone has forgotten theirs or people down in the audience want that. Um, the, um, the other information that you have is the first is a map that shows um, kind of by location um, where first class and second class liquor licenses are just so people can get kind of a, um, uh, a visual of that. The next then is you have a listing of the um, liquor and tobacco licenses, and what you'll notice is this is um, the um, the first the the one page is your second class licenses, and how many of the second class also sell tobacco. Then the next the longer list is your first class license. Um, and um, and then whether or not they sell tobacco. The, um, so of all there are 53 first class. Um, that is your no takeout liquor. Um, and of those, uh, there's a total of 29 tobacco licenses. The um, <laughs> There's a total of 31 second class licenses, um, that is they sell packaged liquor. And then who of, who of them, um, also the majority of them, um, I guess with the exception of about five of them, they sell um, tobacco as well. Um, so that's the all-inclusive list of everybody that we know who has sold licenses. Um, not necessarily to be discussed tonight, um, but it was a, well, maybe, I don't know, as a FYI. These are establishments that have been, um, uh, have had, not necessarily, there have not been citations on these. I think we need to be really clear. These are, some of these are, they've gotten called to the establishment for disorderly. Sometimes there's been someone who's gotten a DUI who said that was the last place they drank, um, that, um, so of these, so just that this is just that the establishment was in some way named or involved with um, a police action. But really to be clear that that is different from whether or not it was, um, they were actually cited. Um, so with this, I believe it was um, the discussion today was to talk about um, how the board determines the liquor licenses typically when a liquor license comes before the board they um, 
the board will make a decision whether or not to grant the liquor license. Typically, it is granted. Um, although this is, there are sometimes there are restrictions placed on. Um, and with that, I guess I'm going to kick it back over to the board members who themselves wanted to have this meeting. Well, I'm going to flip right over to uh, Jesse. Uh, although him and I, I think we're. Uh, thinking along the similar lines about uh, liquor licenses. I have said in years past, I have often wondered why, because I'm actually not a uh, Vermont native in the state that I was from. Uh, there is a certain amount of liquor licenses, which would be the first class liquor licenses, and uh, you couldn't garner a license unless there was one available to you. And I had often wondered why that wasn't the way that we do it in the state of Vermont. Uh, and each state is different. So, uh, and another issue that uh, came about uh, was that uh, I voted against uh, Rite Aid when they came for a second class license. And I didn't do it for any other reason in terms of proximity to the high school. In fact, that wasn't even in my thought. Uh, part of my thinking there was is that you already had several establishments uh, within probably 500 feet. You have four or five establishments uh, where you could buy alcohol. Uh, and had I thought about it uh, previously, I probably would have voted against Walgreens uh, for no other reason than I look at pharmacies as pharmacies, but then I look at Rite Aid up on Putney Road and they're the state liquor store. Uh, so, uh, having said that, I'm going to flip it over to Jesse for his thoughts and uh, uh, see what he feels about this issue. Yeah. Well, thank you, Dick. Um, well, I, I think that the, the the whole issue has come about, in it for me anyways, from the perspective of the issues that we were having, uh, particularly on in Harmony parking lot and the Elliott Street uh, area of downtown. Uh, much, much more so, to be frank, than the uh, concern, uh, I guess I would put it, of having uh, liquor establishments, uh, tobacco establishments, what have you, within so many feet of a school. Uh, because I don't know that that's where we've, we've really seen these problems to date and hopefully will not in the future. Um, so looking at it from, from that perspective of the where we were seeing a lot of uh, issues coming to the attention of the police, the Department of Liquor Control, um, and to us as a board, uh, it seemed to make sense to me uh, for the board to consider uh, what, how we might deal with this issue. Now, one of the things we did do uh, specifically to try to get a hands on the uh, situation down on Harmony Parking Lot and Elliott Street was actually have a meeting, convened a meeting down there um, in the summer and uh, those of us on the board went around with uh, either ourselves, other people, or police officers to some of the, to all the establishments, whether they were uh, liquor establishments, bars, or, or uh, other establishments on, on Elliott Street uh, and in Harmony parking lot. Uh, I think that, that brought it to the attention of the public in some respects uh, and was a good thing for us to do. Um, but we continue to see, or have continued to see, some issues with, you know, one or more bars in that in that general area. I'll put it that way. Um, so it seemed appropriate to at least consider uh, <clears throat> the matter of what, whether or not there should be any limits on the number of establishments, whether it's first class, second class, tobacco establishments uh, in town. Um, you know, from from just a general perspective, uh, 
my I guess my view is that I come from it from an angle look if if the bar can make it then let it be if it if it isn't going to make it then it isn't going to make it and it's not going to survive so whether we allow it allow, whether we allow 25 bars or 150 bars or no limit I, I think there's a in general there's a limit to how many establishments are going to be able to you know create a business and keep a business going um, and I almost I, I think of it in terms of uh, although there's some other concerns that uh, obviously are at play here but it seems to me that that really the, the market should control that issue otherwise I, I'm, I'm concerned in terms of the you know how do you reach a number that makes sense you know should it be you know we have the stuff looking at the information that we that was provided us from the Broderboro uh, Area Prevention Coalition uh, you know there are some statistics in terms of, of uh, other communities around the country in terms of how many liquor establishments there should be uh, given the population uh, I mean you could do this for you know gas stations doctors you know you name it I mean you could do that kind of thing uh, there are some again uh, some issues of concern vis-a-vis -vis liquor because of uh, what the, the consequences of that can be uh, uh, when it's consumed particularly by younger uh, folks uh, and the impact the significant impact that that can have on them so it's uh, you know I don't I don't know how we get to the point of saying okay this is the number of establishments that we're going to allow in town and that's it I'm, I'm concerned what might happen on the, the the side so to speak in terms of well you know someone comes to town and there's only so many establishments allowed and they want to open an establishment does that mean they don't get to open unless you know another one closes and is there some jockeying of, or bargaining going back and forth between the bar owners so that the cost of doing business goes up uh, that may be my cynical side my training side from this perspective but I'm, I'm concerned about that uh, in, in terms of the black market if you will uh, in terms of liquor licenses or tobacco licenses uh, so that's you know that's the other side of the coin I guess I would like to hear from we've got 15 folks here uh, or so uh, that you know like to hear from them or other you know Dora or, or Daryl on this and Martha if she arrives in time for this discussion um, so well there the only thing I would say, and I wanted to hear from the folks that are here too, is I agree with Jesse on the part, especially, I'm, I'm afraid there can be other problems with limiting liquor licenses, uh, even corruption. I mean, I don't know, but I mean, I, that, that would scare me. <laughs> um, because all of a sudden that liquor license becomes very valuable. So I just wanted to echo that sentiment. Other than that, I'd like to hear what everybody has to say too. Sure. You know, I, I don't really have anything else to add. I mean, I do think the issue of corruption surrounding limit, <clears throat> limiting liquor licenses is very real. It's an organized crime issue in a lot of cities, and, you know, from that perspective, just, you know, I think it's, that that would definitely be an issue. But right. I, want to, I want to hear from everybody, okay. so. And the, and the last thing I will say is that <clears throat> I do agree with Jesse wholeheartedly uh, about the issue in our downtown area in terms of uh, um, late night activity, whether there's uh, fighting DWIs, and where do we interject ourselves in those situations. So uh, as for limiting the number of uh, licenses that we uh, have in our community, I'm certainly not ready to make a recommendation, but I think it's uh, part of a discussion that would be an interesting discussion to have. I know we're on limited time here, so uh, I'm going to ask if, yeah. if I could just say one more thing, Dick. I wanted to say, and I forgot to, and that that is in terms of the distance from a school. Uh, you know, we there's the, in the materials I recall reading the distance of 500 feet from a school. I it, it that may have uh, back in the horse and buggy days have been effective, perhaps. But I think if I look at the parking lot of the high school you know most of those students there are driving or have access to a car so if it's 550 feet away 
I, I just don't think that makes a lot of sense to me from a practical standpoint to have it to have some distance from the high school because we're such a mobile society you know you get on a bus and get to a, another establishment or a place where it's dispensed so I you know I, on the same token I wouldn't want one right next door to the school but you know if you look in the parking lot we got that beautiful parking lot with lights and it's plowed and uh, markings for cars and there's I don't know what 250 300 cars there every day Not so you know I don't think the, di the distance I, I wouldn't want to necessarily approve one whatever it is on, you know, right next door to the school, but um, I'm not sure having 500 or 1,000 feet makes much difference in today's society. So, but with that, I'll stop and so I can hear from Could I just see a uh, show of hands of who wants to speak here uh, this afternoon? Okay. Uh, so if you would, uh, you can either come up to the, come up to the mic, state, state uh, your name, and if you're from an organization, you can certainly do that. Uh, and if you're from town, that, that would be great. Uh, and because I want to get you all in, I may kind of go, and so we can pass the baton off, and we'd like to hear all of you. So uh, who would ever like to start? I'll go fast. Okay. So I'll go um, I'm Terry Daniels, and I'm from the Brattleboro Area Prevention Coalition. And um, I'm also here representing the members. Morgan's passing out. We had a community letter that went out. Um, I just want you all to have a copy and so you can see what was in the paper. Um, we um, just are the group of concerned citizens, and we wanted to talk about really today that the greatest number of changes are through policy changes. So we wanted to look at in Vermont, um, there was $129 million in 2007 spent, with $106 million being attributed to youth violence and youth alcohol treatment. That is a direct effect on all of us. Um, suggestions that came from the community. This was part of it was from our community conversation we had last year. We had about 70 community members come. Their first suggestion was limiting it being within 500 feet of not just the school but you serving an organization so that there wouldn't be something like right next to the Boys and Girls Club. We're not talking right down the block but something right next to it because you see that then every day going in and out and those are all different ages. So that was something from the community that was important. Um, what we do know is that research has shown that the more alcohol sales sites in a neighborhood, the more violence there is. So that goes into talking about Elliott Street, and the more that you have, it goes up. Um, specifically, an increase of 10 alcohol outlets per 10,000 people increases a 34% risk of male on female partner violence. That says a lot for our community um, and the safety of the community members. Um, we also would like if I know that's a hard thing to think about, but just notifying, we have some simple suggestions, just notifying the public if there's a liquor license so they can make a comment if they're concerned about where it's going to be located. Maybe putting it on just the website, the town website, something simple so we would know when those come up um, would be important. Um, mandatory yearly responsible beverage service trainings, we offer those free of charge to all service trainings. Anybody can come from anywhere in the state. We have people come all the time. We offer four a year. But right now it's every two years. Um, Dover does it where it's every year. So something like that can help. It can be something a little easier and it's not hard for a business to have to participate in. Um, the other thing that we think would be really important is in developing your policy, looking at ways to renew and approach the policy. Um, there's a sample one in there from Wilmington to help guide that, just to make it easier to figure out how to renew that. Um, I'm not sure where it is. Um, and that's just so that you can see what other places do for applications of licenses to see what kind of guidelines they use to decide if somebody shouldn't be renewed or not. Um, and I just thank you for your time. Thank you. T Terry, can you, can you tell me on the, the compliance checks, is that all done by the Department of Liquor Control, basically Bill Manch and his crew? Yes. Okay. Yes, and that's just a chart I made up based on what, as of now, there's nothing been reported for 2011. So that's through this week. That was everything I could find. Terry, also, um, if establishments send their folks to these quicker uh, training sessions, their insurance rate goes down, doesn't it? I believe so. It's all, they're all co-sponsored by the Department of Liquor Control. So okay. they're well, all I think they it activated. does, but I wasn't sure. And if it did, that's they another reason why they should definitely do years, it. So it's, yeah. it's a mandatory okay. thing that they go every two years. It's just seen that it's been more effective than yearly. Um, they actually 
actually had now, they just started an online training as well. They actually started an online training as well for off-site places. It's just, I'm not sure when it got up, but I know today when I checked, it's on, up and running. Um, it's not for servers, but it is for sellers. So that makes it easier. Thank you. Next. <coughs> Hi, I'm Mary Kane. I am representing three incredible sons who have gone through the teenage years here in Brattleboro. And I have very big concerns about our lack of ability to provide them with established rules which will enable teenagers in our community to see that we have taken a stand on alcohol and drug abuse, and alcohol in particular, because we are increasing our abilities in our community to show our young people that they are allowed and encouraged to go to alcohol establishments and alcohol areas such as the Beer Fest on Putney Road. Not okay in my book. Not okay. We are having difficulty in our community because of alcohol and teenage problems in getting police protection or police intervention for alcoholic parties at homes that are serving alcohol and um, having them actually come to the actual unit and follow through on that and providing some sort of a policy in place to prevent that from happening again. We do not have an anonymous t tip line which would alert individuals if there was a drunk person or a, a drunk teenager or a house party. In other words, you have to take a stand. You have to stand up to other parents who in many cases will ostracize not only you but your children for standing up against having an alcoholic um, party. And so we need to create, in my opinion, some more cohesiveness to allow the school, which has been extremely supportive when um, parties were alerted, in, in, in my case, that were serving under al underage alcoholic, I mean, underage al whatever, <laughs> who were serving kids who were underage alcohol in the homes. Um, to follow through. We do not have that in place right now, and we need to have that sort of thing. So when you're looking at giving out more of these uh, establishments, uh, the ability to serve alcohol, what you're saying to our community kids is it's okay. It's not okay. It's not okay any day. I will stand here before you and say it's not okay today, tomorrow, or the next. No matter what amount of money that you're going to allow these people to establish another liquor establishment in our community, it's not okay. The long-term effects of welfare, poverty, violence, crime, abuse are not okay. And I'm here to say this is our opportunity to say we have to make a decision and say this is enough. I believe it is. Thank you. Gene? We, we do have a tips hotline, right. 251-8188. We can re receive anonymous tips on that line. The problem with anonymous tip is we can go to a scene and try to see what's there, but we can't go busting doors down and going into people's houses. We do have to follow some, some rules. But we do have that tips hotline. Yeah. Rules. rules, that's right. Yeah. Thanks for following um, yeah. <laughs> Next. Hi, I'm Kathy Waters, and I'm on staff at Youth Services, and I'm new to Brattleboro about two years ago. A uh, couple of thoughts. One is um, Walgreens is definitely a hangout for the high school kids, and whether they have cars or not. They are definitely there buying their chips and their candy bars, and there's the booze. And, you know, we have a kid right now going through diversion who stole a bottle of alcohol from a convenience-type store and gave it to a friend. So I think, you know, the out-of-sight, out-of-mind thing isn't complete, but it helps. So if it's just right there in your face, the risk factor definitely, definitely goes up. And Walgreens is the place to go after school. Um, that's one thought. The other thought is, you know, if we limit, I mean, I get the, you know, sort of capitalism takes care of things, but if we limited the number of gas stations or, um, doctors, you know, that wouldn't impact 
if we didn't limit those, it doesn't impact the need for more law enforcement, the more diversion people, the more student assistant professionals, SAPs at high schools. You know, it does, it, there's no downside. And whereas when we, we know from all the data that increasing alcohol in the community most definitely increases the need for all those kind of services when, frankly, our funding is getting cut. I can talk for law enforcement. You know, none of us are, are walking away feeling like we've got more to offer the, this community. We have less to offer this community. And the other thing is, uh, again, just so, someone sort of new to the community, I do think there's a, a thing we have to think about which is kind of who, what's the tone of our town? You know, um, I've lived in a couple of towns and the tone was kind of, you know, seedy to be honest with you. And, and you know, I won't name any names, but one or two new establishments here in Brattleboro, I thought, yeah, not that cute little New England feel <laughs> that I moved up here for. So I do think it's appropriate for us as a community and for you folks in leadership to think about you know, what's the tone of the place? And, and that matters, along with all the research that shows that really was, really will impact our young people if it's this available and this just, you know, really easy to find. So I don't think anybody's against capitalism and the sort of a normal flow of business, but I do think it's important to think about how are we coming off here in Brattleboro. Thank you. I'm Ken Schneck. I'm the Dean of Students at Marlboro College. I'm also an alcohol and other drug educator by trade. That's how I got into this field. So obviously this issue is pretty important to me. Um, I guess what I'm here to push for is just some sort of rubric by, when, by which when these licenses come to the select board, you can look at some sort of checklist. And what I was struck with last time, and I really appreciated uh, you openly struggling with, okay, so this is another liquor license. What questions are we supposed to be asking right now? Because I'm having a hard time believing that there's not something in between really the rubber stamp that's happening right now and organized crime of limiting licenses. There has to be something in between that. What I'm struck by is that, as again, as chair of the Town Arts Committee, that there are 20 sec 26, 27 rubrics that you have to fulfill in order to have public art in the town, but I don't know what they are to get a liquor license. Um, and so it strikes me if you have to do this much to get public art, but just coming to the select board and asking for a liquor license, there's not a big checklist that you have to go through. That's problematic. So I just am pushing for some sort of process because it's very clear that right now there isn't really one to go through to consider, well, what are the different factors? Sure, how close is it to schools, but how close is it to other establishments? What's the range that they're selling? Price index is a huge deal. Uh, a lot of communities are looking at price index of how much they're selling alcohol for. So. I'm certainly not here to tell you what the rubric should be, but it, it certainly we need them now in order because they will they will keep coming, and I appreciated struggling to say all right well maybe we shouldn't say yes, but what questions do we even ask? So just wanted to push for that. Thank you. Excuse me. Can Sarah? I just respond? Because a lot of people, what well, he just asked for a question. A lot of people think we just rubber stamp these. We get the packet comes to us, we pick it up on Fridays, let's say. We go through the packet. Now on the liquor licenses most of the time, it has to go through the chief of police first. And if he says it's okay, usually there is, no, if there's no flags for us, then it looks like we rubber stamped it because there's no flags. If there is a flag, usually we would call and say, hey, I got a problem with this, what's up? Somebody will get back to us mm -hmm. and the problem's taken care of. Because you're not the only one that asks that. A lot of people think that we just sit here and all of a sudden there's four liquor licenses and we're going, well, you know, I make a motion, we accept this one and bang, it's done. But we do get a packet and we get to go over that and we do rely on our chief um, to do backgrounds and things like that. So there is, I don't know if there's 24 that they go through, but, you know, it's not quite as rubber stamped as everybody would think. Yeah, one of the things when you talk about the boys and uh, girls club, actually the boys and girls club went into a, a former bar. Uh, <laughs> a big bar. Uh, a big bar. I think uh, actually I was, uh, was working, I was working mm -hmm. in town and, and uh, I, I, I had seen. gone there once for, for a beer and now it's the boys and girls club. And when you talk about distances between establishments, well, there's, there's uh, you know, you have the latches and you have a couple of... Uh, What's the name of the bar in South uh, Flat Street. Flat Street. Uh, and so you have a boys club across the street. And, you know, it, 
35 feet, 40 feet away, you, you have a bar room. Uh, one of the things also mentioned was uh, training. And uh, uh, Jesse had brought this up uh, uh, with uh, Wal uh, not Walgreens, but Rite Aid and had they had any violations. And, uh, and I think that they had had a tobacco violation. And uh, we were concerned about training because I look at some of the ages of the people uh, in these establishments, you know, gas stations and, and Walgreens and Rite Aids and the supermarket. And uh, a lot of these, some of these places, uh, even an old codger like myself would have to show his ID to to get a bottle of wine. Uh, and I, I certainly know at the supermarket that I shop in, uh, they do that all the time. Uh, and those, I think, are the things that we're looking for when we're going to go about renewing licenses. Uh, do I? Th my concern is that every place on, on Main Street in Brattleboro says, well, I think I want to start s selling bottles of wine. It might be in vogue to sell bottles of, bottles of wine. And is that what I want? I'm concerned about the number of uh, restaurant bar rooms, yeah, or do they turn into bars on Main Street? Jesse makes a good point, uh, you know, in terms of survival. Uh, when you only have a town of... Uh, 12,000 people and a limited number, you know, a limited number of people who can support these establishments, uh, you know, the, only the fit survive. And But you certainly don't want to see your downtown go into vacant places of uh, where you can get, uh, where you can get a drink. Uh, so, I mean, th those are all issues that you, you think about. Uh, trying to figure out how we monitor uh, these establishments. And I think that this board and the previous board really started looking at, okay, if you have X amount of violations and you're having problems, what are what is the recourse for the board? And I think that uh, in our ordinance that uh, we can pull you in and We'd have to have a public hearing to pull your license. It's a lot easier if the state does it. Uh, but we want to be aware of that. We certainly want our down. We want every place in town to be safe. Uh, and I'm certainly concerned with un underage drinking, uh, as I suspect that everybody in this room is. Uh, a lot of us uh, have uh, children, uh, not 21. And so it, it is an issue. It's an issue in every town. So how, and I would agree with Ken, how do we go about uh, making sure that whether it's uh, alcohol or tobacco? Uh, there's been a, a state tobacco uh, ordinance on the books for, I think, at least 10 years, where if somebody under the age of 18 is smoking, you can get out and give them a citation. And I don't think that we give very many citations. Uh, uh, although it sounded good when they did it, I would think I, d I don't think that we give out very many citations for the smoking. Uh, so, is there anyone else that? Uh Hi, my name is Allison Villars, I'm executive director of Youth Services, which is a countywide organization supporting youth and they're uh, growing into a state where as adults they can thrive in our community. Um, I've been listening to this discussion and, it's, and this topic has been forefront for a very long time and I've been executive director for five years. And I have uh, in general uh, a little picture of concerns and that is that it appears that our society is in in general, and I'm not talking about Brattleboro specifically, backing off on boundaries and uh, supervision for youth. So I will say in regard to health, uh, we are not funding as many health classes in schools as we used to fund. And when cuts are coming, we're seeing, oh, well, you know, they go to doctors, and so the doctor will tell them what they need to know about such and such. and 
um, they've got parents at home and so we're when we're cutting besides bands and art and those kinds of things the next thing that gets cut is health and that's being cut in our communities as I speak um, so we're backing off of that we're backing off of regulations that keep kids safe uh, if you look at youth risk behavior uh, studies for that the Department of Health put on kids are not just drinking malt beverages they're, they're the largest percentage of kids who have identified self-identified that they have been drinking in the last 30 days are drinking hard liquor so we're not talking about a beer here and there we're talking about something that is much more potent and potentially much more inviting because of the sweet taste of it versus the malt taste of it that will get them going in a particular direction. So I think that the fact that they've identified that is a problem. If you look at youth risk behavior and you see that youth will not get in a car with another teenager who's been drinking, we're all excited about that. But you know who they're going to get in a car with who's been drinking? Their parents. They will report that they will get in a car with an adult who's been drinking. So we have a community culture where our kids are identifying that because my adult ex, whoever that person is, is drinking, I can't say no to getting in a car. But with a teenager, I would tell them no. And they are watching our behavior. So when we're making these rules, or we're not having as many inspections by the state or enough trainings that we need to have servers go through or sellers go through to protect our youth, we're sending a very clear message that we're backing off. And I don't watch a lot of TV, but any time I've seen TV in the last couple of months, any TV program has people pulling out a drawer in their office pouring liquor. I'm going, where are they getting this liquor? I grew up with Dick Van Dyke. They didn't drink at home. And so I, I think about the messages our kids are getting, which are significant and severe and important and longstanding. Media is telling you it's okay to drink. So we have parents who are at home um, and who are using punishments that's not positive punishments necessarily, but corporal or psychological aggression, that sets a tone in a kid that they are more likely to wind up as depressives and using or abusing alcohol. So if we have every single system in place, potentially something with parenting, potentially something in schools, potentially somebody not setting strong enough rules in our community, we have a whole culture moving toward that this is going to be overtaking us long term. All of your attention that you spend on Harmony Parking Lot and Elliott, maybe we could do some stopgap measures that are much more stronger, sending a much clearer message to kids and their parents that would be helpful long term. And those discussions would cut back on the amount of time you can spend. My last thing is that student assistance professionals, we have seven of them in Wyndham County, two of them in Brattleboro. They are prevention and intervention specialists in your schools. They are the first people who see people who've been using, abusing alcohol or drugs, or at high risk for such. The state proposed budget from the governor's office cuts all the funding for those positions. So people who might have caught those kids at risk aren't going to be available to do that in the future, unless maybe you guys call our state legislators and talk to them about that. So every system sort of backing up just a little bit without strong enough um, cultural imperative saying this is where we're going to hold the ground. And I just implore you to look seriously at what you can do to hold that ground. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Joellen Torello Falk. I'm the executive director of the Center for Health and Learning. We are a national technical assistance organization in the area of uh, help promoting healthy and school, uh, safe school and community environments. I'm also a state and nationally licensed health educator, 
and I'm the mother of a 14 and an 11 year old and I have a very vested interest in working with you towards promoting a community that creates a healthy and safe environment for my children and all of our children as you said so thank you um, I want to start off by saying I didn't attend, intend to, to um, attend this meeting. I have some very cryptic notes. I'm going to talk a little bit about big picture, and I know that when it comes to data and examples and exemplars, you can get them from the Brattleboro Area Prevention Partnership. So um, I want to applaud BAPC and the Select Board for having this dialogue. These are tough issues, and they are s extremely important issues. Um, I want to uh, mention that the Center for Health and Learning has two relevant technical assistance contracts, one with the State of Vermont Department of Health to provide technical assistance to 26 substance abuse coalitions around the state, such as the Brattleboro Area Prevention Partnership, which are seeking to address issues around priority issues, the impact of alcohol and substance use on our youth, um, the impact of high-risk drinking, the impact of binge drinking, of drinking and driving. This is a dialogue that is going on not only in, at the community level around the state, but nationally throughout the United States. And again, um, we, I appreciate that you are taking on a discussion of these issues. Um, we also have a federal grant from the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration for Vermont youth suicide prevention. And so I'd like to just talk for a moment about the relationship of alcohol to all risk factors in youth. Alcohol is connected as a very, very significant mental health factor in just about every youth risk, risk behavior. If it's teen pregnancy, premature sexual activity, um, if it's school success, uh, if it's truancy, if it's detention, if it's law enforcement issues, crime, um, if it's um, drinking and driving an accidental, um, uh, they no longer call them accidents, they call them crashes because they're generally caused by um, some behavior, often alcohol related, which is not reported in the local press for a variety of reasons. Suicide is highly indicated by mental health issues, depression and substance use. So when we talk about alcohol, it's a nexus for talking about a very large variety of youth issues, risk factors. And so what we're really here today to talk about are protective factors for youth. And that's the big picture I just want to talk about for another minute. Um, you've raised the question of how. And that's a very important question. I don't have the exact answer for that. I know there are answers out there. And basically, you, you need to enter into a dialogue with the community about how you establish some relevant and appropriate criteria for making that decision. Um, but I would urge you to make the criteria and that decision based on positive health outcomes for our youth. There are predictors for positive health outcomes for youth. Those are called protective factors. There's a long list of protective factors. One of them is public-private partnership around access to alcohol. Else, access to alcohol is probably the single greatest impact, along with parental supervision and the kinds of norms Allison was just talking about, that a community creates together. What we have learned in public health is that we need to work as a partnership. It's a public and a private partnership. We need to involve all the professions. We need to involve primary care doctors, law enforcement, public health um, personnel. We need to involve primary care, clinicians, youth serving professionals, social service, faith and community leaders, and funeral directors because they often see the outcomes of the end products of communities that refuse to take on the really hard issues. We all have a role, and this dialogue is, is incredibly important to, to the role that we all play. And we will make all of our jobs easier, educators included, uh, and not the least among our which educators, because they struggle every day with youth who are either engaged and going to have successful outcomes for learning or are not engaged. And one of the biggest predictor, predict, predictors for successful outcomes at school is the kinds of risk factors and the mental health issues students are presenting in their classrooms every day. 
Um, you've raised the issue of corruption. I know that's a, a very significant thing for you to think about. Again, um, I know that there are some discussions and, and answers out there. We will help you research those issues if that would be helpful. Um, again, the best way to tackle uh, corruption is through public-private pri partnership and issues related to policy. One last thing is that somebody mentioned tobacco, and I'm so glad you brought it up, because tobacco is our single greatest public health success in the United States. We went, since the Surgeon General issued his report in 1964 about the role of nicotine and tobacco in public health, we have gone from over a 50% tobacco use rate down below 20%, and we've done that through public policy, through partnerships at every level, and I mentioned the professions before, which are tackling this from their angle. We know that public access to tobacco for youth has had a hugely significant impact on use. Now, I told you earlier, I'm a health educator, nationally and state licensed and certified. So I work with them in the classroom on individual level of change. But that doesn't add up to the equation of lowering risk factors. What adds up is when we take individual level of change and we add it with public policy level of change. And that's the dialogue you're having. So I urge you to think and look closely at the tobacco arena because, again, it shows us that setting tobacco-free zones, establishing policies related to tobacco, has an incredible return on its investment. And I'm talking dollars and cents, and I'm talking impact of happiness and long-term mental health in our communities. Um, the health outcomes, physical, mental, social, environmental, are absolutely critical when we have this discussion. And protective policy creates positive health outcomes which ultimately lead to a return on, on our investment. We know that for every dollar we invest in prevention, we save 10 or more dollars in later rehabilitation, issues related to prison and detention, et cetera. So thank you, Brattleboro, for leading the way. Thank you for having a public-private dialogue about this. And if the Center for Health and Learning can be instrumental at all in the discussion, assisting you with research, please call upon us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joellen. Uh, very informative. Uh, anyone else? Uh, anybody from the board would like to make a comment after anything that we've heard here? Well, just just uh, one of the one of the people that I didn't hear you mention just now is parents. Uh, everybody else, but I think it's it starts at the home. A lot of these problems stem right from the home, and I think uh, you know we can we we talk about or at least uh, people I talk with they you know we talk about we ask the schools to do so much these days that you know you wonder how they get any learning in because there's so many other things that they're required to do. Uh, but I think it, it comes back to uh, the fact that, you know, it starts at the home and we as adults uh, and parents of kids have to take, have to set the, the t first tone because that's where, th that's where they learn a lot. And I think that's, that's really important. These other things are, are necessary uh, because in part we as parents have abdicated that responsibility to others. Um, you know, and I don't think we want to go back to a time of prohibition because we know how that didn't work. But, you know, I look at, the, in terms of the getting back to the density, and I want to thank the Brattleboro Area Prevention Coalition for providing the materials that they did to us uh, a couple of months ago. And having looked through that stuff, I, you know, I, I looked at it uh, carefully, but I, um, you know, if we take uh, the 12,000 people that we have in the residents of Brattleboro, and if we take the, the number of outlets uh, for the year 2005, there were 600,000 licensed retail alcohol outlets, outlets in the U.S., or 2.7 2 per thousand. That would equal about, for the town of ours size, about 36 outlets, and we have about 85 outlets. However, if you take Iowa, our good old state of Iowa, they were 7.25, so that would bring us to about 84 on 12,000 people. But I remind you folks that we grow, fortunately, uh, I think, uh, for our economy anyways, we grow, in some respects it's not so great, but in some respects it is, and that is that we grow, people tell me, to 25,000, probably more like 30,000 uh, on a given day. 
Uh, so, you know, we're probably, under the Iowa standard or the 2005 standard, probably not that much out of line, if you will, if you, if you use that as a, as a bar or a standard. Uh, and, you know, we look at what's on the interstate uh, on a Friday night or a Sunday night. The number of people that, that come up here from out of state, uh, you know, they help our economy. Uh, yes, they bring problems. The police can tell you that. Uh, uh, public works can tell you that because our roads are used more and those kinds of things. But, you know, nevertheless, uh, I think the, the, the bottom line, I guess, is I don't see that we've got a basis at this point, anyways, uh, to say, well, the density is too much uh, and we should therefore limit the number of licenses. Because I think there are, as, as I mentioned earlier and Daryl agreed, I think that there are some, you know, countervailing uh, disadvantages of doing that. Um, but I think, I think it's good to have the discussion and bring this to light. And, you know, I, uh, I would hope that uh, it will probably be coming an on ongoing dialogue. I mean, in a couple of months, this board will be, you know, issuing 75, 80 licenses potentially. At least they have to get renewed every year. And we do look at that. You know, uh, when a new person comes in uh, that wants to start an establishment, one of the things we look at is what the police have told us, but also they've done a record check. And, you know, I know that we've seen ones where they have maybe had a DWI or something like that. You know, those have been squelched, whether you, you know, the public realize it or not, they've just gone away. Because we said, hmm, that's an issue. That's a potential problem. So, uh, and we also look at the ones that are renewed in terms of what, what issues that they have had, uh, at least as far as the coming in contact with the police. Um, so I think that uh, it's been a good discussion. I think uh, it's nothing I can propose at this point anyways, uh, based on what we've, what we've heard. Darryl. I, I got a question for the chief, and it's on, and I don't know if you have it, chief. It shows some of the um, uh, establishments. Thank you. Establishments that had some violations. Okay. One of them on here, and I just want to know what we do on this. It's, it's, it's dated 3 2 2010, protective custody point 205. I imagine that was his alcohol level or hers. It's got the same docket number. So we got the weather vane and McNeil's, all right? My question is, how do we get, how do we nail both of them? Where, where they, was one of them, I mean, which one did he come from last or her? I keep saying him. Uh, that uh, may just be a typo there. One, one or the other, I'm not, hold on, I'll, I'll get your answer in one, one It should be the weather vane. Well, for, it, it's the weather vane, and then down below it's McNeil's. Yeah, I think I don't know how Okay, so it just got on both spots. Right. All right. And then my next question is on the responses. You got a lot of no's. It, it, it's the establishment, I think, that was supposed to respond to these when they get them. Is that correct? Yes, the establishment is supposed to respond to us. We, we do provide this to them, and they're supposed to give us a, a written notice back whether they talk to the bartenders, no matter the doorman, whatever they did. What did they do once they got this notice? Even if it's a, you know, we got nothing, we don't know anything. He wasn't here, he was here. Or, as we talked at the quarterly bar owners meeting, you know, if that guy's throwing me under the bus saying he was drinking here, you know what, give him a trespass order, don't let him back in your, in, in your establishment. He's causing troubles. He's draining the resources of the town. Don't let him back there. Sooner or later, he's going to run out of places to drink. He or she's going to run out of places to drink. That's hey, thank you. For. Stay and, right there, and Chief. I, and I will tell you, it's not a mistake. That 1522 yeah. is listed under both Weatherman and McNeil's. So when he was, when he or she was taken into custody, they must have identified both establishments, so both were notified. Okay. Then on that one. And I don't want to get into it too, too much, but I, that one right there, I don't understand how they can both be because they both served them. We don't know who, if somebody served them one beer and then he went to the weather vane and got trashed, or I just don't know. And that, that's why I was just wondering how they we could. Very connect. well, they have done that. And then during the discussion with the officers, I was here, I was here, or he was seen at both places. Okay. So we'll put them on notice of listen, this guy was taken into protect, protective custody. He's, a, he's well over the legal limit a couple times. Um, someone over served him. He identified your establishment. He identified both of you. Okay. Maybe not let him back in. And then one more thing, Chief. 
on uh, the Malls I 1025 2010 unlawful mischief 294 wow that guy or gal was pretty plastered unlawful mischief now when you pick them up is that the same way the guy said I just came from the Malls I or this was one he was out uh, there was someone seen out in the, the Harmony parking lot punching the side of the car did some damage to the car he was uh, in the uh, Malls I drinking earlier okay. he was taken he, he was charged with a crime and they were notified all right thank you <clears throat> And uh, one more thing I'd like to say. There is one establishment, I'm not going to say, that has been on our radar now recently that we are looking at. They may be pulled in. They may not. We're not sure. And that's because of the work of Jesse and Martha uh, and going to a lot of meetings. So um, we are doing some stuff. It just doesn't always go into the public eye. I just have a question. I would have, you, have you get up to the mic? We're, and we have about... Uh, I just want you to know what happens if an establishment doesn't respond. I'm going to I'm going to address that issue, uh, and uh, I want to point out one more thing. First of all, we've done a great job, and I I, I want to say that about the police, because if you allow more alcohol establishments to come into this town, you need to know that in Vermont, they can market to a younger crowd. They can get them in. They can show them what alcohol does for people. And I don't care how many X's you put on anybody's hand, they will see that alcohol is served to the point of where individuals in that establishment will be drunk. And it's happened before. And it'll happen again when I got a call from a teenager saying, hey, by the way, we're all going to meet at ba 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 uh, and they have a band, then you need to know that you can market in the state of Vermont. It's allowed. I called the liquor commissioner on this one. To younger folks. So if you're willing to take on that liability, you need to understand the consequences of getting them in early. Thank you. Uh, as we uh, finish up here, uh, Allison, to answer your question, one of the things that uh, we can do, and uh, I will recommend, I don't know, uh, when we start to uh, reissue licenses as a condition of their license, we will have, uh, we can impose on them that you need to respond uh, when the police department sends you a notification of a of a, a DWE and they say this is it. So we can force the bar owners to respond to uh, the questions by our local parendi. Uh, the other issue uh, that will merit some discussion, and it needs to be discussed because it's easy for me to go, okay, we're going to impose a training requirement on anyone who serves beer and alcohol. Uh, but in some of these places uh, that are not first class liquor licenses, you have a lot of uh, high school kids, and I don't know if it's a requirement to get training, but there's an expense factor, and I can tell you that there's a high rate of turnover too. So I think that that's something that we have to at least have a discussion about uh, making that potentially a requirement if you're going to sell uh, beer or wine in the second class phase and also for first class establishments. So uh, we will continue the dialogue. I want to thank everybody for coming here. We're certainly aware, we're concerned as you are and you people are working in the field and uh, uh, I want to thank uh, Jesse and Martha uh, who have been the two committee people for us for the past uh, uh, year, a little over a year and the meetings that they have attended and uh, at, their, at their behest that we set this up. So uh, a lot of credit for the information that uh, we have as board members goes to these two. And uh, we're going to have to find two new board members to fill those seats because we're going to lose uh, two valuable people on our board. But uh, We got one volunteer if he makes it, maybe. <laughs> I, I got a feeling. Uh, and so... Uh, we'll find two people to take their seat uh, with the same passion that Martha and Jesse had. So thank all of you for coming, and uh, we are going to continue this dialogue. So thank you. I would accept a motion to adjourn as liquor commissioner. So moved. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. aye.
We are the liquor commissioner. We're going to take two, two minute two break. Yes. Two minute break. <laughs> you may want to move chairs so you can see. Um, That's part of the list that we have in front of us. You'll have the spreadsheet that we have in front of us. Correct. Okay. Um, okay. Let me. You said I'm sorry to bleed. So, um, what do you have? Melissa, I'd like to know what you have first because we're not going to actually start with this. Um, I just handed out the budget. Um, what you also have in front of you is the, uh, the capital plan. Um, we have, this is the capital plan um, that is, um, if you'll look here, it's just to point out so you can follow. The capital plan's been divided on your sheets You've got total water projects. You've got total sewer projects. Okay. Then you have fleet, and the first section of fleet is is distribution. And then as you go down, you'll see distribution totals, and then you see the water treatment totals, and then wastewater treatment. These are, so what we're trying to do is divide up the capital plan by our two, by wastewater treatment and by water treatment, okay? So what you see on the bottom, those bottom um, here is for FY11, you have, in addition to, this is the 26 million, that's from the, obviously, but without the upgrading, without that 26, without the majority of that, we still have 32,000 in um, in capital. And then for the water treatment, we actually have 648,700. These numbers come from, so for our wastewater treatment plant numbers, they are the, if you look on your sheet, they are the, Wastewater treatment is your total sewer project. So if you look at FY12, you've got, there's 50,000 under total um, sewer projects. That's because there's 50,000 in the sewer main replacement. No. There's meter upgrades. Huh? No, it's a meter upgrades. No. no. So we're looking at sewer. Oh, oh sewer. Sure. Yeah. So you have the 50,000 from the sewer. You'll note there's nothing directly under the wastewater treatment plant under the fleet, but under distribution. Distribution, they do both distribution for water and sewer. So what we've done under the distribution, the fleet distribution, we have, um, <coughs> we're taking 50% of that goes to uh, water, 50% goes to sewer. So of this 25,000, 12,500, goes to wastewater, 12,500 goes to water treatment. So that's how you get the 62,500, okay? So this is just trying to explain that the capital um, that is in addition to our, um, that's in addition to what we're, well, the, the plant upgrade because even though we're upgrading the plant that doesn't mean we can ignore our sewer mains <coughs> um, so that's the that's the idea here what you'll notice in this capital plan if you're looking so if you start with your water projects in FY11 there was the Pleasant Valley Dam there was a 2, 219 for the Chestnut Hill Dam that water mains there of the 150, that's actually from that emergency up the road. And then there's Puppy Road, Puppy road yeah. And then there's meter. And the wastewater treatment, you have the wastewater treatment plant. You have, uh, and then under the fleet, there's a 19, in, in, F12, in FY12, there's supposed to be a 1999 
um, service truck and a tracker, and these were things that were approved last year. We did um, have 150 for the water mains last year. Well, I, you uh, approved it during the course of this year as an emergency so, project, oh, okay. but we have that's to what show what it in there. Okay. okay, that's what I thought. Um, and under the FY12, what we're proposing is um, 50,000 a meter, 50,000 a sewers. What we're trying to do is, after some discussion, is how many, when you're looking at mains, whether they be water mains or sewer mains, how many could you really replace in a year? And what you'll see is some years we're doing sewer mains, some years we're doing water mains. Some years we're trying to split it a little bit. Do we, we, know, do we know how old each one of these are pretty much? The yes. Water mains, yes. Yeah, water, sewer mains, so maybe yep. about. These, the inventory of, of the infrastructure for our utilities is actually Good, good. No, just because it's old, you're going to break down. I look at myself, you know. But um, this might. We're going to try and fix you though before you break down. <laughs> Steve, we've been, was. I was in we've the been, doctor's department before I got here. Keep myself up. We've been doing meter upgrades for several years. How many meters do we upgrade for the $50,000 that we have in there? Rick's got some updated information on that. We can do 5 8 meter, which is the base size meter. We can do 235 of them for $39,950. For sake of conversation, about $40,000. Okay. Radio read is more, larger meters are more. Okay. Uh, for instance, a 2 inch meter can be $2,000 for one meter. Thankfully, we don't have that many big ones, but we do have some. So, in the way it's laid out, in 15 years we will have replaced every meter in the system and we can start all over again. Because the, the Is light that about the use of light? They have corrosion, things like that. Batteries sure. built into them. Or tip, you can't replace the batteries. You have to basically just pull it. The new meters are all going to disposable. They have an internal battery and then after 15 years you just Dispose of the unit. The old meters had a bronze, a bronze casing, and you could rebuild the meters. And they didn't have, they didn't have a battery per se. They went on pulse. So, you know, now it's everything's going disposable. So, do so listen. Are these? You mean to tell me we're going to be replacing everybody's? Well, mine's in the house. Yeah. Right? We have been for many years. Really? Yeah. I thought it was only the businesses. We just have to doing. into your home, yeah. Good. <laughs> I'd like to keep my old one if you don't mind. I'll I'll take, I, just, much water, I, so I don't want anybody in there. Because <laughs> uh, you got to go down to the cellar and the whole nine yards. Which to read it though, they just put a thing on the outside and poke it in, right? Okay. All right. Well, I can't wait till that's done. Okay. Okay. So this is your. This is a proposed capital. What you'll notice in this is um, when you're looking out, we it's it's important in utilities that we get a good idea of our capital for the next several years because of the debt service, because of trying to calculate our rates. It's not a, it's not so much a discussion. Well, we'll put it off to next year because next year we got a twenty we got thirty two million. 20 years, <laughs> um, and so it's important for us then to start looking at the whole the whole nine yards. You'll notice some in the water projects, some of the bigger things we have as you look at the whole, the whole gamut is the Black Mountain um, water tank that needs to be, we need an assessment done of that, and then we need to look, that was uh, how old? 1965. Is that the two million dollar item in 2013? No, that is the four hundred thousand. Black. It says black empty tank. Third item. Third item down under water projects. And so with the third, there's thirty five for an engineering. And there's four hundred for uh, actually it's not really this. I guess it's engineering, but they have to go in there to look at the interior, interior of the tank. And the two million is the first loan that we're looking at. Too. Two million is the water treatment plan to start looking at the upgrade of the water treatment plan. Oh, and that's just plant. that's just a, that's water treatment. Because the water treatment now is over twenty years as well. 
1989. That's the book at Pleasant Valley? Yes. Yes. And did we need anything in this coming year's budget for engineering for that? I think that what we're going to look at with that is realistically, I don't see starting anything on that until 2013. And I've just put in kind of a placeholder for the whole for the world. Um, we don't have a good estimate of that. We had a plan that we had was a done. We had a estimate done, but uh, that you're right, done. I think it's a placeholder now. When was that done? It was done about six, yeah, six probably years, five years ago now. So, uh, then we have water main replacements that we talked about and then the meter upgrades. The reason you continue to see the meters is because when we get them all replaced, we start right over again. That's going to be a forever bunch of items, really. I guess. <laughs> um, I did, I asked Gene about that, but he said that right. You then, under the sewer, you have water treatment, the whetstone interceptor, we don't have anything in that right now. Um, that is, those are the, the, the lines that go under the whetstone, or in the whetstone actually. The state is preparing a plan for what work we need to do now to test it. We have to do every year some type of videoing to make sure they're not leaking or do any, see if there's any issues. Realistically, at some point, those are going to have to be moved. And that is, I have no idea how much that's going to be or when it's going to be. Will the state say, boom, you got to have an out by such and such we a We were date? talking with um, Gene Forbes was here today, and Mike Schramm was talking with them about it, and they were kind of saying, probably well, the state's kind of moving slow. They're just now saying, this is your plan of what you have to do to look at it each year. He thinks that, you know, more and more people are saying, no, you don't want those in the, <laughs> you know, you don't want your sewer lines in your They're sewer lines, brooks. Not those are sewer, yeah. Um, and that, you know, eventually there probably will be some, you know, probably be come from the federal government to the state. Um, you know, time frames on that, estimates on that, you know, it's, it's a guess. Right now. But when those were put in, it was probably state of the art and safe. And when it was put in, it took what was accessible and turned it into a clean river again. Right. That's why the interceptor was put in. So it's like now, my, now it's a bad thing, but it was a great thing. It was it's like my million dollar knob and two in my house. Yeah, that's awful. You've had that too, huh, Martha? Well, I got some of that knob and two in. Yeah, so do I. That is going to be, that's, 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 that's probably that's our yes. biggest unknown. Thing. And it's also it's unknown because when, how much. And, and to move that, we have to get we have to get easements. Would we not? To move yeah, we have to do, we have to construct lift stations, and it's just so huge because there's certain you know everything goes by gravity now. And once you took it out of the uh, stream bed, then you have to pump it. To be realistic about these kind of things, we're going to wait for the federal government. The federal government is going to say this has to happen. I guess it's okay. I think our biggest thing is keep it stabilized, keep it inspected, and to ensure that it doesn't have leaks or problems. I mean, that's that's what we're doing right now. We're trying to keep it, put a television camera up, make corrections where needed, uh, rehabilitate manholes. We've done a lot of that type of work. We've done some root control measures, and uh, just keep up with a kind of a proactive maintenance program. You know, what could you do? You could develop a reserve fund, an actual reserve fund, and take the county meetings. So the reserve fund will put money into this every year, you know, for that specific use, but you're still going to have to get some type of idea of how much it costs. How many miles of it are steep? It goes average. from... Uh, how many are eight? there? How many what? what? I mean, is the whole thing in there, or is it there, just the, that cross? No, there, it's right in the in the Brook Street in places. It goes from lower Main Street, actually, um, all the way up to what Stone Brook, um, past Diamond Stone, uh, Western Avenue, and then it crosses a few other times. So we have two miles of it at least. Oh, yeah. That, so actually, miles. that new one that comes out of the trail. Yeah. Right? That's on the list of three. Wow. Wow. So, um, I guess we'll have to look at 
we have the plate, the water distribution, um, these service trucks, um, trucks and facilities. Service trucks are actually the trucks that have the little things on the back. They're not just a pickup truck, they have the do that. Little Chili. stuff, you know, that you put stuff in. Little box. Uh, and That's then, same is true with water treatment plant. They have, this is the water treatment and waste water treatment plant. They both moved to the Yaveo compact cars. We did that in 09. Um, so this is the plant. This here, as I said, this kind of um, takes it each year. What's water? What part portion of this is wastewater? What portion is water? Um, with that, then um, remembering that this is a utilities, um, this is an enterprise fund, so you don't see your capital in your, you don't see all your capital actually as your expenditures. Um, it's the balance. It's a balance sheet matter, which makes it a little more confusing. But what you then have, um, you also have the budget, and there have been some changes to the budget, um, some, not a lot, some fine-tuning of the <coughs> health insurance, as well as some, um, that 20000 I think, it, it, for the permanent testing that we talked about the last time. The operating budget, this little sheet that you have here, the one sheet was operating on the top. This takes, when you look at your budget, so you have the revenues, and then when you have the expenditures, there are several different sections. Somewhere. You can see that through real quick. So then you got under that, you see how it has total water supply expenses, total wells expenses. Um, Total water water distribution, and then on page um, on page on page two of five in the middle it says total water supply. That's the part of the operating that's total water that's water. Okay, and so you see that in FY eleven our budget amount is the nine nine hundred twenty three thousand seven hundred and ninety. And so you see that on this sheet. What I've done is taken those totals to, and summarized them on this on this Excel spreadsheet. That's for this year. The nine That's nine. for this year. That's what we have budgeted. After that, in your in your details, you have all the expenditures. And on page um, three of five, you have total waste wastewater plant amounts and for. FY11, the budget is 1710000 That, again, is, is on this sheet, just to summarize it. And then under that, you have your total administration. Total administration, you'll find on um, page 4 or 5. And the administration is the portion of Steve and Rick and um, portion of um, the, the clerical, um, the computer, the um, those things that you can't readily divide between direct, they're not the operating costs for the plant, they're the supporting services costs, the computer systems, the treasurer's office, those kinds of things. Now, what I've done, that comes to a total in FY11 of 1,463,940. And what I, what that, what? I was just trying to compare the, what you have on the, the one sheet. Mm -hmm. uh, Look at FY11. Yeah, but then it looks like it's 1,416,800. That's right. That's down below the one portion. Okay. Keep going so okay. you can see keep total, going total utility. Total utility. Right. So you have to look at that total Same thing. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Okay. And then right after that is um, we have debt service. What I'm we're we're going to be ignoring debt service right now. Okay. We're ignoring debt service right now um, because of, and because what we're building up to the the excitement is building to go to our rate sheets. 
What we're doing here is we decided when you look at the administration, when you total administration is you can figure out how do you divide that between water and wastewater. There's all kinds of ways you could do it. What we've done is we've looked at what's our total water cost, what's our total um, wastewater, and you'll see it fluctuates a little bit. It's really close to kind of even, you know, within a hundred thousand less than of being kind of the same. So what we did with our administration is we just decided, let's just split the administration, 50% water, 50% wastewater. So then to, uh, to get our total operating water, we take um, the total water plus 50% of your total administration, and that gets us the total water. Total operating wastewater is the total wastewater, that one, that one million, a little bit over and 50% of the 1.4 million. And I did that with our budget for FO12 as well, okay? Mm -hmm. The reason I gave you this sheet is so that when you go in, we're gonna go to the rates now. Are you doing that, can I ask you a question? Yes. Okay. Why do, why is it that we only show depreciation in the wastewater? Depreciation is in both. It's in it's in under administration. It's at seven hundred and seventy thousand. Right. I see. It is under depreciation. It's under both. That's for both. That's for both. And why isn't it shown separately? Uh, because we have a, we have a budget for wastewater and we don't have a budget for both. We could. We could split it out. We could take it out of administration and split it. That's just what we did. We could. It hasn't been, to be honest with you, it's not refined enough. Okay. To be honest, it's to, to actually go back to your assets of your wastewater and your assets of your water and to, to, to do that kind of refinement. I, I have talked to the auditors about actually creating a step, you know, splitting the two funds and have two separate funds at times. Mm -hmm. It, it would it would make things a lot easier in some ways and other ways just you know accounting for the admin you have to do it that the issue is yeah. they're separate but but this put together both, you know and there are there are different. many things that are really hard to figure out how what's you know your your even just your billing your computer software you know those kinds of things that are in your administration that are that are hard and then there you have the things that you know, we arbitrarily said, we decided, you know, at some point you just make decisions and you say, well, distribution, all those distribution fleet, those vehicles, we're just going to say 50 50. The reality is, you could keep a log of whether you're doing something for water, or whether you're doing something for wastewater, and then actually do an assessment on that. I, don't, I remember talking with uh, John and Ann about this exact and issue Anne. that you brought up. Was there a decision made that? We're okay the way we're doing it, or was it suggested that we do that right now? I don't, I know we talked about it, but I Well, I wasn't in that meeting, so I, I'm, I'm not sure what you resolved. What I've resolved with them, I, I talked to uh, John Mudge last week, and uh, asked him what he thought about the idea, because I didn't know you guys were in the mm -hmm. conversation. He said, I think it would be a great idea. Um, It'll be a complicated project because you do have to divide the assets. If you've got a truck that's doing both, you know, when you buy a new truck, do you charge half of it to one and the other, or do you just, you know, charge it to one and charge costs to the other? There, there's just a lot of things, and we have to look at all the assets too. And we look at you know, sewer main, water main, and stuff. But you have any combined services in water and sewer? We both like on a to-do list. It's Somewhat something that's probably future. worth doing. You end up then with, you know, three budgets right. with under public works. Right. Will our depreciation be able to, because I don't quite catch all that anyway, but will it be able to go up after we do all our new work? Are we going to get more than the 770000 after we put in a new plan and stuff? Is that yeah, the idea that depreciation is essentially you're taking, you're just saying, you're you're doing the total assets money. and taking a percentage, right? Yeah, you're putting money kind of aside to, to 
to continue to buy. So part of your depreciation is purchasing those things, in the, is purchasing the stuff in the, the CIP, in your capital okay. improvement plan. Right. You're purchasing the, with use, essentially using your depreciation cash, <laughs> the 40000 for the service truck. It's kind of a difficult concept. Basically, what you're doing, like we're, we're doing a waste water plant now, 20, there too many days yeah. ago. With the depreciation, you're actually spreading the cost of that over the okay. next 30 years. Okay. It's a non cash expense, but you're recouping what you paid in one, in one or two years. You're spreading it out over 30 years. But the question then is how do you do that? Because if you got a 20 year loan, and you put it, you're depreciating your new asset now over those 20 years. Are you really at the end of those 20 years? Does it make sense? Is it wise to say, well, now we have enough cash to do a new plan? <laughs> well, no, because you're not doing that. that you're yeah. Yeah. The, the, um, you're actually the, the cash part of that is your debt service payment that you're mm -hmm. you paying, and your capital addition. That's why they're not shown in the revenue and expense summary. They're shown on the balance sheet. And then the depreciation starts at all the It gets <laughs> it gets really complicated. And it's been really complicated working with oil tanner and trying to figure out to go to the, the rate sheet, which we're at the wastewater rate sheet now. Um, we'll look at that. The only thing of interest in the wastewater in, under the FY10 of the um, is the only number we're, we're interested in under the FY10 is this, essentially this is our beginning balance for our rolling year in balance that four hundred seventy nine thousand five hundred ninety one dollars that we John did some calculations with regard to the. Net operating assets for <laughs> operating the surplus and divided it between um, water and wastewater. Of that, the, the line share is in wastewater, and that's the 479. We also have a water spreadsheet, and year 10, it's that 192,731. So $192,731 plus $479,591 is $675,672. That's that yeah. rolling surplus. That That's the total to surplus. When you go to your, when you guys have finished reading your audit that you got, and if you go to one of the pages in there, you'll find that number, 672. And that's what we're there. That's what we're there. The, the spreadsheet that we looked at last March, I think, came up with it. What was the number that we wanted to have in here? Was that that number six? No. Plus. It was high. Yes. It was, it was like 576. Yes. Yeah. It was 576. But that was water and wastewater or just no. water? I'm not sure wastewater. what that was at that point. I'm not sure it wasn't both. That's why I'm asking whether. I don't believe it was both, but uh, I'm not real sure how it was calculated. I'm trying to keep us on track, but did the issue on Putney Road uh, affect that? This is up by 10. So it certainly, so so it certainly would affect the... Uh, It'll affect the water. You'll see that. We'll show you that bad news in a second. That's not real cool. Yeah, I saw that. I um, saw that. <laughs> all right. Now let's go. If you're on your rate sheet, okay, you see an FY11. So $1,700,000. That corresponds to this number right here on this sheet. Okay? And that's what that number is. Okay. And in FY12, you'll notice the 1.751, and that's the same number. So that's this number here. You know, water or sewer? I'm sorry? Water or sewer? Is this, is this is sewer. Okay. 
okay? So then um, the next number is lost depreciation. Depreciation is actually in that number and we're taking it out. And the reason we're taking the depreciation out of the operating is because, like John said, your depreciation is used to fund these things your bond and your notes and your bond, your principal interest capital, that's here. This has been something that John has had to talk with the auditors about to make sure that does this, does this work, does this fit? We've had several conversations with Foyle Painter on this, of whether or not, you know, are we, are we capturing everything? Is this the way we can show it? And at this point, everybody is in agreement that this is how we should be doing it. This is how this is the best model to use to project for projection of rates. Um, and some of this is like math class, where you just say, I can either try to figure out the theory, <laughs> or I can just say. The auditors have said it's okay, <laughs> and so you get to your bond payment. These are that's, that's the um, recovery zone bond, and that's the interest only in the FY11 that we had to pay, and then in FY12 that's actually interest and um, principal, and that's why it goes up to the 923,000. And then your capital replacement and repair at 32,000. That's actually the 32,000 that goes back to your capital improvement plan and that 32,000 in wastewater treatment plan operates without the um, without the upgrade. Okay? And you'll notice next year the 62,500, that's where that number is. Okay, is that? So this is now, we feel relatively comfortable that we have, we have actually our expenses in here. If you look down here, what you'll see is, um, for a while I've just taken the capital, the number from the capital, and just placed it in here. But as we get further out, we start adding money I, I take the capital plus additional money, and that's because we need to start building up for additional repairs, etc., that we're going to need for the new facility. You know, because by 2016, you're going to start repairing things. As, as I look at uh, FY12, and I go down to Brattleboro year-end surplus deficit. And okay. I see we, we go from uh, 2011, we have a, we have a uh, surplus of 584,121. Where are you at? I'm in the... Are you on? Yeah, I'm on this quarter. Okay. And yeah. so in 2012, I see a deficit of 92,488. Right. Right. And that is because we all of a sudden, up here, we went from 176,000 of interest to the 923,000. We started having that, that bond so the principal payment on the $13 million recovery zone. And so we don't have enough save. We're gonna, we don't have enough save. And. Okay. That, however, if the rolling year end balance, we will have several years, you'll see them, you see the several years that we have where you, all, you end your year in a deficit. But that's why it's important to have the rolling surplus. And so even though we have the deficit of the 92, we're going to have, we have the rolling surplus of the 971, 971,225. 
<clears throat> Down here, so basically what this does, you go all of this, this, this is kind of your cost, your total program cost. You go into your program revenue, which is basically you, um, up here, this is when we start, we anticipate starting to receive septage again. Okay? What year is that? That's why 13. That was another change. We had in the original, we had started to receive subjects in FY12. So that, that hurts the revenue. Right? That hurts the revenue. Now you do notice up here under the operating costs in FY13, they've already estimated what savings we're going to have in operations, some additional savings in operations. So that's where that number comes from, the 185. And that is a calculation that was done by the engineers. We're going to save money. Now, then you have your other, you have your, um, your, these are then your base rates, your total quarterly base rate, your annual base rate, um, and then you have the total of that. So in FY, because you have no septage in FY, you haven't, you haven't started to take septage, um, your base rates are really your only that's your cap, kind of your capital recovery. Down here then, this then goes into, you can go into a lot of minutia about it, but the reality, but basically what you're looking at is you're trying to figure out what's your, um, where's your break even, and where's the recommended, um, and these, And then you get into the um, the net costs, the net year end surplus or deficit, and then your rolling balance. Now down here, the six, the first line is the annual increase in your base rate is six percent, and then our annual increase in the user fee is also six percent each year. This is what we, this is the five years that we started on. So this is this is what's in our ordinances right now. This is six percent. So these numbers up here that are in yellow, these are the numbers that you see if you go to the ordinances, and those are the numbers that we have. Um, now, what we had had in here was eight percent for the next several years, and then went down to four percent. If we cut that, if we keep it at eight, we get down to here. So now we go, oh, this is this is eight as well. If you go, if you have eight percent, if so after originally we had said we're gonna have a six percent increase for these first five years. Then they were calculating about four years of an 8% increase, or three or four years of an 8% increase, and then they were gonna say, then you go to a 4% increase, and then you go to zero. That was the original projections. So if we to stuck with that, you see we get into a negative rolling year end. If you stick with that eight, eight. If you, we move this to eight as well. You see, you get these two years of negatives. Okay. Well, you can't have a negative, really. So you try to figure out. So what I was talking with Mike and Gene about is, you know, so here's where you can get into. You could go down. You could say, well, instead of an eight percent increase, let's do a nine percent in those next years. I can I ask you a question? Uh -huh. Because I'm looking at my annual percentage increase rate. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the bottom two lines. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 6.1. Mm -hmm. uh, FY11 is 6.1. Mm -hmm. 12 is 6. Mm -hmm. 13 is 6. And 
14 so. Right, and that's what we have. And then, or, that's what we have. And then, then in 15, 16, we're at nine. This is, with what I've done here, this is basically kind of a recommendation. To keep with the six, as we have, to not change. You could change the rates for FY13, 14, or 15. You could make our, you know, FY13, 14 from that 6%. You could make that 7% or 8% or whatever earlier. And this, I'm just trying to show you everything you do. So you say that's, keep that at eight. Um, that's what our, it was projected. Say you go to a base rate increase in FY13 of 7%. That gets rid of those negatives. If you, you have to probably notice that well, at 17 you're at 12,000. We might have to go to an 8% at some point though. Two, two, three. But if we, if, if in 13, mm -hmm. okay, you're, let me go, let me start over. In 15, we jump from 6 to 9%. Two years. Okay. For two years. I would, I would much rather have a smaller incremental increase than go six and then bingo nine. And then and that, the next year. This is these are the decisions. Up. Right. Yeah. But it's helpful to see that because because you it's not it's not it's, it's a nine percent increase over what you had the year before. Excellent. And then another nine percent over what you had the year yeah. before. Yeah. And then you go to eight percent it's, it's lower but it's still an eight percent increase. Say you go to Say you go to here, I changed it, I kept the 6 set at FY12, 6 set 13, and 14 I went to 7. You then could stay with your 8, 8, 8, 8, 4. If you go into FY13... What about if we moved it to... What if we did something for 2013? That say you go up to 7 and just your base yeah. rate. That's right. Go up to seven and just your base rate, and then you have but the, the, you, you get rid of your negatives. The user rate would be still the same. But just the base six. Is, okay. Just your base. You, you, get, you, you get rid of your six. Um, so you the say, in thirteen, if we went to seven, seven. on a base rate, on a base rate, and then in fourteen. We do the same thing. Another seven. Another seven percent. Okay. You're doing it in Say again. Right I'm sorry. Seven. Pardon? We're saying just seven on the base rate, not both rates, not the user fee rate, right? And that's why thirteen. Yeah. That's right. Okay. So seven and six. Seven and six. Seven and six. Seven and six. And and then in then in fifteen, you go to. I, I don't think you would have, well, you're, 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 in 15, was your projection to go to 8? Because in 15 right here, you're going to 9. I so, changed it to 8 here. So, if you, if you I increase think we would earlier, be, you can decrease later. Right, but, but because we're going higher earlier, my feeling would be is that why can't we keep that at 7 in 15 instead of going to 8 because we've had two years. Probably won't be 8. You're going to end up in a negative. Well, we, end up, we don't that year because we have one with 8. We do in 17 and 18. Right. You still end up, it, the goal is not of any negatives right. upon that. On the ground of a rolling in balance. Yes. Okay. So you have to go to, well, what is, what is 7.5? Year and saying what's it look like now and what's it look like now. We can't let the negatives get too big 
anywhere. <laughs> but you gotta, you know, you also have, you know, in 2017, who knows? You know, because that's that's anticipating if everything in the next five years goes the way we planned it, that's where we'll be. Well, right. one of the things that we didn't anticipate the users, the users, yeah, the drop, that's going to happen. The drop, and I users. had, I did get a lot. I bought a um, the last three quarters of this year, and of the, the three quarters we've had of this year, the three quarters of last year are about the same. Water usage. Water usage. And that was the other thing. So one of the things I was talking about: when do you do your base rate? When do you do your um, your user fee? You know, your base rate is supposed to cover your, no matter what your usage is. You know, your operating is no matter what. That's, you know, and and then your user fee is, you know, that can fluctuate. So, and the idea is you don't have to, the idea is that, as Gene was saying, is that, you know, when your usage goes down, you have operating expenses that go down. And and then we were trying to talk about that because I, I my opinion was I can see that in water. It covers but your I, fixed costs. I don't but I but usage remember when we're talking wastewater our usage that we're, it's driven by your water usage. And if your water usage goes down, you have to know why your water usage went down. If your water usage went down because people are conserving then you're going to have your plant is going to see a reduction in operations. There's going to be a reduction of what comes through your plant. If the water usage goes down because of rain, that doesn't necessarily mean because then your water, your wastewater plant may actually have more of a usage and maybe using more chemicals. So it's not necessary. So that's what I was saying. Gene was I don't see it. Being, I don't see it being kind of this one to one or you know this this simple ratio. I, and that's where I get confused with. It. One, not to throw a monkey in the room, but, we've but got, gonna. I'm going to, because we've got a, we're talking a couple of years out, a two million dollar expense. That's water. I, I know, but, you know, I know. Well, Let's, you want to look know. at water? Well, that's no. use a lot of red there. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> I, 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 I'll bring that up when we get to the water. Okay. But can, if we do this change, can you get rid of that online file thing so we can see? The, okay, so we've got the seven 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 eight eight. We did twelve months. We'd have to go out. We'd want to go out five years again, right? Yeah, but I, I think we'd want to. But under the caveat, we're going to be reviewing it every year. Right. So even though we're going out five years, who's ever sitting here? Right. Right. The question for this board really is, you know, how far out do you guys want to be thinking? How far out should every board be thinking? March 1st. <laughs> <laughs> this is my dry run. <laughs> yeah, I think how are you doing this crap again? <laughs> it's good for five years, right? <laughs> right. Uh, well, can, well, can it? I mean, right now we're looking at the numbers just, you know, from a budget standpoint, but you know, one of the things we looked at when we tried to do all of these rate changes was look at what that actually means for um, the user, mm -hmm. and um, maybe maybe a little bit of that information might help us to be able to figure out well, you have what, that. what that really. You have means. that. That's what this average average annual cost of homeowner. Average cost increase to home on. That's what you have. That's there. But what I'm seeing is that's with the percentages the way they are now. But if we're going to change and increase that to seven. Every that, that changes every time, time you make a change. change. It changes, it changes, it changes, it changes but, but that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So if you see, if you go out three lines from the bottom, okay. So no, if you're, no, I, 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 I'm seeing that. What I'm seeing is we're talking about changing to seven or to nine or to making it out, but, but that number 
needs to, we need to see how that number changes as well. Right there. Well, so if you go to the seventh and you see it's 33, 33, 32 in FY13. If you take that back down to the six, you're at 32, so it's about a buck, 32, not quite 13. a buck. Right. So it's under a buck. So at seven? No, it's right at right a buck. Yeah. Keep, the, keep going at 14 dollars it is there. Let's see. It's, it, it's, a, it's a, uh, about a buck and a quarter. Well, stay go to seven five for 13, because that's what we're looking at. Seven five? Seven five, yeah. Okay. It was, it's about a two buck, not quite two bucks. Mm -hmm. Two bucks a quarter. So two bucks a quarter. So cost that's increase. A, cost increase. Yeah. So that would be an eight dollar increase. Eight, an increase on that for the for the year. Right. Yeah. So that no, that is the annual sure. cost increase. Well, that is the annual. Well, that is eight dollars a quarter. Right. That's right. That's what the that average. Would be. The increase. The cost increase for okay. that year is the 33. Okay, the difference so between going from one four. to the other was okay. the dollar. Okay. Divided by the four is, it, is an eight dollar a quarter increase rather than okay. That's user. I'm gonna guess that as long as you're only dealing with your base rate, that yeah. percentage is probably gonna hold. So every half percent is eight cents. So in probably probably so in 2000 <laughs> in, in FY15 if you went to eight percent just in your base rate yeah. Then we get then we get rid of that. Went ten dollars up, didn't it? What was that? I don't know what. Forty two. So in sixteen. So in fifteen we go to eight percent and we end that rolling we get rid of the deficit. And so then in sixteen if you drop down to 7.5. You'll be in the deficit again. Yes. Nope. Nope. Then you drop to 7. And look at it, it's, well, there's only uh, Yeah, well, what happens if you carry it out, though? That's right. Yeah, you know, in 2017, you go to 7.5 or 7. Keep going out. <coughs> Some of your parameters think how low do you want to go? Yeah. How long do you, how low do you want your rolling air and balance to be? Because the lower it is, the more of a mistake it is. You know, the more any little mistake will throw you out. Yeah. You don't want it to be too high though either, because then you, there's no you're raising money without you really need it to. Um, but then again, if, right, so when you're looking again, you're looking over five years out, six years out, maybe twenty thousand is okay because you've got, each year you're going to be looking at it, you're going to be saying, you're going to be monitoring it. So you know, and it doesn't take much to really screw this thing up. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah. I mean, if we had $150,000 expense this year, well, in October, if you November. Have, well, let's say that. Let's say that suddenly you, you get, get that um, money from? in FY12, all of a sudden you have an increase in expenditures or something, say of 100 which isn't that much on a 1.8 million. And then you go down here and you look and see, look how quickly you go in the red for years. Yeah, hundred thousand dollars. That's a hundred thousand dollars. That's that's a scary part. Right. I think there's a. Is there a meeting here tonight? What time? Uh, we're only going to go to six, six. o'clock. Yeah, I've got a feel out here. So, uh, let, let me just get a consensus. There's a high school, yeah. Oh, yeah, the high school meeting is too. Uh, can I just really quickly say, because it is that we do have to look at our water rates. We did it increase in the percent We are going to be in deficit this year. Next, this year? Are you talking about rates, rates, or base rates? 
to adjourn. So moved. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. It was unanimous on both.